Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I just realized, or I realized in the other workshops that I didn't introduce myself too much uh, in, into detail in the in the lectures. So I would like to do that at the beginning. Um, then uh, you might have seen in the um, um, in the schedule there is a presentation, or there was a workshop scheduled uh, about um, a mobile demonstrator, maybe a trailer. We we have a trailer on the parking lot with a lot of IoT devices in it, or uh, with the KNX uh, trailer, uh, or sorry, um, KNX demonstrator. Uh, but it turned out that th this doesn't work in an online scenario. So. Um, what we did is we, we you know, during last week we or I prepared a small uh, kind of emergency workshop, um, which will uh, yeah be around let's say IoT devices the little um, um, development board we have sent to you in in your in your welcome package. Um, it's a microcontroller ESP32 in this case. And um, yeah, we, we we do some programming on that, and um, yeah, we talk about security key distribution, and we use that as a LoRaWAN um, uh, device. Um, we, we already talked about LoRaWAN, which is a, a long-range IoT um, protocol. So it starts from the physical layer up to the the application layer and defines every everything uh, in accordance with those uh, ISO OZ layers and um, yeah we we talk about key material how to how to distribute keys I, I show you how to set up uh, yeah an application and uh, this is the, the plan for today as this is a workshop so you you have to do most of the work and I just realized I have to catch my my uh, iPad. It's there because I would like to share a, a kind of a whiteboard, a Jamboard with you and the one that uh, Zoom is providing. So this application here in front of you uh, isn't working very well. So um, I'm, I'm using a Jamboard. Uh, so I just realized I forgot to bring it. It's, it's over there. So give me, give me a second. Um, what I'm going to do is to share a Jamboard uh, with you guys. And here we go, a new one. Uh, and uh, share it with you. Um, boom, boom. And here we go. So, there's the zoom window again. And yeah, if you open that link, you will be able to see what I am painting. And if you want to, you can you can paint or type or whatever on this shared whiteboard yourself. So let me see, is it here? And there it is. So in parallel, I'm sharing the screen here in Zoom. Um, Just wait, zoom again, share screen, and that's the right one. So yeah, it's working. Um, yeah, how would you, now it's up to you, how, or no, no, 
I'm, I'm sharing the workload with you guys. Um, yeah, let me let me first introduce myself. Thomas, as I said, Thomas Mund. Um, I, I'm working for the university on a permanent contract. So um, yeah, I, I, I will stay there <laughs> until I get uh, uh, yeah, retired. And uh, this is not the the worst perspective, actually. Um, I'm, I've am i been uh, studying computer science myself, and uh, then I've been moving to Frankfurt um, to work for a bank for almost two years. Uh, my, my workplace was in Frankfurt, and uh, sometimes I had to travel to London um, to, to talk to those yeah, business people there. Uh, after that, Actually, I, I didn't like it. Uh, I, I, I quit the job for the bank and uh, uh, got a scholarship. This was my opportunity, a scholarship at the university to, to get a PhD. Um, I took this chance to, to get back to Rostock. I um, got my PhD in 2003, I guess. Yeah, and then I joined the university. And yeah, I... I I stood with them for for that entire time, so it's my seventeenth year now uh, for the university, and I I really like that. I liked to teach, to to do some research, and we are currently I'm the project leader for four projects. So actually, Johann Johannes, no, not Johannes, Johann, Simeon, Andreas, and Dashit. Uh, working in projects um, which we acquired in the university in in that area and yeah then the idea yeah, arrived that we that we think or that we that we yeah, start a summer school on the same topic as the the yeah, the group is working on mainly so security in buildings security in field buses this is what i'm i'm currently doing um, I've, I, I do remember that uh, Yaroslav, who's the only guy who's sharing his screen right now or his, his video, uh, is from Ukraine, Lyov, Lyov, I guess it's in the west, isn't it? Yeah, it's next to the um, to the border. Um, I haven't been there. I, I have been in Kiev, in Saborozhye, in Charkov in nineteen. 86 it was a dangerous year actually together with my parents at this time i was 12 years old so my parents took me there um, during the summer so um, 1986 is um, being 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 in kiev let's say 100 kilometers away from chernobyl and and during the summer uh, turned out to be a bit dangerous at the end but uh, yeah, we didn't care much about that because uh, yeah, there wasn't so much information in East Germany about that. Uh, um, but luckily, uh, nothing ever happened, and it uh, yeah didn't, didn't had any any long term consequences. So it, it wasn't that dangerous. So the the wind was going north, and uh, yeah, Kiev was fine, I guess. Um, I I just. Uh, remember that I've been there when, when uh, during the cultural night uh, presented by Yaroslav and his colleagues um, in, in was it yesterday? No, the day before yesterday actually. And I, uh, I, I thought uh, my parents must have some some pictures of that. So I, when I uh, next visit my parents, I will get some. I think they they uh, made those on on positive films. So how's it called? Uh, if you have a projector, put the put the film in, and uh, not not on paper. So uh, maybe I can grab them and uh, yeah, digitize them or so find them some some information. Yeah, maybe. Um, what I do remember, we we visited a lot of um, monuments there, or big monument. Uh, this this uh, lady with the sword in it uh, in the hand, and uh, yeah, as I said, I've been twelve years old, so it's it's long time ago 1986 um, we visited a how's it called in English in, in Russian kolkhoz uh, 
So uh, a farm actually uh, further south between Kiev and Sharkov, I guess. So uh, Sharkov you, you is, is further to the east, I, I, I remember. So and uh, yeah, the Dnieper, the, the famous uh, river there. And yeah. Um, so much for my side. Um, Bruno, uh, where are you from? I don't remember that. I, I, I don't remember the, the presentation. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I'm from Brazil, actually. I'm, You're from I mean, Brazil. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in Latvia currently, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm from Brazil. In, in Latvia, so you're in Riga or somewhere Riga. around? Yeah, okay. The capital. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is actually my 13th summer school or so. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've been to Riga to uh, basically all three Baltic states because the, the summer schools, yeah, it's kind of a tradition for us. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we have been in the, in the Baltic region since, I guess, two, 2005 or so. Um, I didn't attend all the summer schools. Uh, so sometimes I was to China and said, yeah, let, let, let me have some holiday and uh, let the, give some younger colleagues some, some uh, the chance to participate in the summer school. But I've been in, in Riga, I've been here in, in Estonia, in Tallinn, mm -hmm. uh, Tartu, I've been to Kaunas, Vilnius, uh, Hlaipeda. So actually, yeah, we, we have been traveling a lot <coughs> in that area. And usually mm -hmm. I spend some time after that uh, to, to visit after the summer school or during the summer school to, to the, the, the countryside. Or we had some, some uh, excursions in, the, in that area together with the students. So it was, it was a bit different when, when uh, it took place in presence. Um, yeah, but now there's no traveling needed. And um, actually, yeah, we, we put a lot of money in the, into prizes and, and gifts and so on. So you will get something at the end, don't worry. Uh, but uh, you don't have to travel. Carolis, where are you and where are you from? Uh, I'm from Lithuania and currently staying in Lithuania. In Lithuania, where are you? In which part of the town? Uh, this, I've, I've visited everything, I guess. So yeah. I'm in Kaunas. In Kaunas, okay. So uh, uh, yeah, we have been there, I think, five years ago. Um, after that, we have been to Klaibeda, which is next to the to the shore and uh, yeah, for, for us it was was impressing how, how fast everything was developing in that area um, for people living there it was always yeah it could be faster but uh, for us uh, from the outside everything was developing so fast and actually the, the structures are totally new so um, the structures i mean even organizational structures if you go to a university in, in germany everything is uh, as it was 200 years ago and um yeah they have traditions and and in those uh, let's say baltic states uh yeah they they have kind of a emotion a kind of a they, they have true speed in their development and uh yeah it was some decisions are, are usually easier to, to to do there and yeah there will be cultural night today for Lithuania, I guess. Is that right, Carlos? Uh, yes, I'm going to present something as well. Yeah, okay. So we, we will all join that and uh, have a look at, at Lithuania. Um, yeah, <laughs> one thing I remember is uh, in, in Vilnius, we spent some time in a student's dormitory there because uh, at the beginning we, we thought, yeah, we don't need a hotel. We, we can live like students. Uh, even Professor Chap was there. Uh, so my boss, he's my boss. And uh, there was one week during the year when they, um, when they renovated the, the heating system and they usually turned it off uh, during the time we had our summer schools there. So the, the showers have been cold. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I think it was uh, VGTU, and I think it was uh, nicknamed Kamchatka in, in uh, uh, Vilnius because it was on the far east of the city. And uh, yeah, I remember they 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 um, they refurbished the the heating system, and uh, so we only had cold water. And <clears throat> There was only one guy uh, who decided uh, to leave the dormitory and uh, to go to a hotel and uh, it wasn't me 
so I don't tell you any further details. Um, yeah. Um, um, yeah, but what about you, Salatil? You, you are mentioning real computer science. We have to work for a brain. Yeah, no. They, they do some fancy stuff. I've been working for investment banking IT, so... Uh, yes. We had to we had to get a lot of <laughs> we, we had to let to get a lot of uh, data from from data providers so Bloomberg and and Reuters uh, they yes. were, they were providing a lot of market data and we had to um, yeah we had to monitor the markets and uh, to calculate the internal risk in a bank so because uh, they had to underlie the risk with their own capital in order not to go bankrupt uh, in their own. Yeah, um, yeah. How's it called? Their yeah, own market same market. Here. Yeah, <laughs> the same here. Yeah, but in uh, in Santander banking in mm -hmm. my country in Spain, and also I've been working in financial markets, and my market was secondary market. That uh, the world that is not real life. Mm -hmm. Actually, just they bet money for the future. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that uh, that's what they do. So they 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 play with their customers' money, yes. and uh, yeah, the, they have to calculate the risk yes. and re report the risk to the to the um, yeah, to the government. Actually, and, it's very uh, funny when. <laughs> yeah, it's very fun. I was working in um, in this case was just in in systems, so let's say the communication systems, not that in the part of, of uh, I would say, uh, developers and, but it was very funny because we had, uh, we had a problem that we, we you don't really get the, um, the how your, your work affects the other, the others. And I remember that we had this huge problem with some servers and so on and so forth. And the following day, I was in the bank, and there was a man in front of me who was saying something about uh, his um, why it wasn't the savings, but it was well, I don't know right now the name in in English, but uh, actions, something else. I don't know the name really. And uh, he was complaining that he didn't get the money, blah, blah. And we, I was saying, oh, it's because that server <laughs> was the one who was affected. <laughs> yeah, I, I was but, there for yeah. almost two years. And then um, actually, it was not the job that uh, that scared me. It was the city. I didn't like Frankfurt because uh, it's kind of a... Uh, Frankfurt. Yeah. Um, Kind of a kind of an ugly city, I would say. So frankly, um, and I've been just uh, yeah, ev everyone no. everyone is working there, but nobody is living there. So they are trying to leave uh, yeah. the, the, the <laughs> town at, at night yeah. during the night, and then uh, yeah, during the night the city is quiet. Uh, and, uh, the uh, night the, uh, the night that city is completely like okay. So. Wide, wide west in certain parts. <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. in the yes. in the station. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the train uh, our, station our, our office was next to the train station, and um, uh, the, the, the bank paid female or uh, female uh, workers. They they paid a self defense uh, course during that time. Oh, yeah. yes, I can imagine. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so uh, let's get over that. Uh, yeah, I I managed to live uh, to leave the, the town. Bruno, how about you? Mm. Did we talk already? No. Uh, Bruno, so I come Bruno, from Spain. You're, you're from Spain, but, yeah. Okay. Yes, from Barcelona. But uh, right now, my life uh, uh, brought me to Magdeburg. Magdeburg. In okay. Germany. In Germany. Um, I know a guy who moved there from Rostock, actually, a couple of months ago, uh, from Nigeria. No way. Um, from Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, what's his name? Um, Chukwupa Obionvu, uh, Victor or something? If he's working in IT, you will know him because he, he's, 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 he's very talkative. So, uh, 
<laughs> anyway. I know a guy, but I haven't met him. Probably, probably he's in my corridor. I mean, yeah. is he in the university? <laughs> yeah, look, look for uh, Victor, which is his nickname in German. Okay, then I will. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will. Uh, say hello to him. Uh, and uh, say he, okay. you, he, he, he is still under supervision. Uh, okay. Bruno, Bruno, where are you? Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, let, let's go to the next. We have, we, we, sorry. Bruno, where are you? Is, are you there? No, you're not. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. Me, Bruno? Yeah. yeah. I, I have a list here. I, I see you're all the participants in an order in an audit list. So. Uh, I, but yeah, but I think I already said about me. Yeah? Uh, I'm from Brazil. I'm from yeah. Latvia. Yeah. Okay. You said this. Carolis? Yeah. Sorry. Carol yeah. yeah the, the order has changed in the meanwhile, I guess. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Carolis, where are you? Yeah. I also just said I was from Kaunas. You're from Kaunas? Yes. Okay. And uh, you are in Kaunas right now? Uh, yes. Okay. How's the weather? Today is a uh, sunny day in, in, in Rostock. Uh, same here. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of rain in the previous days, but today is sunny. Yeah. It's, it's, it's getting um, autumn fall now, uh, so um, the, the leaves are already turning red somewhere. So starting to turn red, not really, but uh, yeah. I see a tree here and uh, I see some red, red leaves already. So autumn means if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. It will change. Okay, Lisa, bist du auch mal hier? You are here to visit us. Good morning. I'm not, I'm not muted, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you you just, just dropped in, yeah? Yeah, I, I thought maybe I could learn something. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we just in the, in the small talk phase at the beginning. So to, to, ah, okay. to loosen up the tongues here a bit. So yeah. morning, Lisa. Uh, good, morning. good job today, so far. Today I could walk to, to work without having a scarf and... Uh, uh, jacket for the cold and everything so yeah. today is a good day in Germany <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the only day in the week where we have sunshine eh? and Ramil where are you? Hello uh, I'm from Azerbaijan from Baku mm -hmm. I, uh, I, right must, now I must admit I'm, I haven't been there <laughs> <laughs> it's near to the Turkey and also near to the Georgia Yeah, and you are you are at home? Uh, no, right now I'm in Vilnius. In Vilnius, okay. Mm -hmm. Another guy. So you are in Vilnius, Kaunas, all all around there. And <laughs> yeah. you're you're studying in, in you're studying or you're working there or? No, I'm master student of the VGQ. Okay. Oh yeah, you 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 asked that, so you know the dormitory. The, the, the one they yeah, call Kamchatka internal. They, they, the one they call, uh, they used to call Kamchatka internally, right? Or you, you don't know the nickname. Now it's gone. And Nerius, you are the last one on my list here. So just, just wanted to say hello to you guys. Uh, yeah, maybe he's he's off for coffee. So, first question to you guys: uh, What is a microcontroller? Mm -hmm. if, if there if there's a question, by the way, uh, please ask because uh, I I do not monitor the chat all the time, so uh, it's better to ask to to get me on the audio channel. So, what is a microcontroller? What would you say? Just for me, I need to visit the other groups, but I hope that you have a, a productive uh, meeting and we will see you later. Okay, thank you very much, yes. Lisa. And have a productive day yourself. So what would you say? I think the microcontroller uh, so also, is the small uh, computer who can say for it, I think. Yeah, okay. So, you said small in terms of size. How else would you classify it? How would you, 
how would you distinguish between a microcontroller and a, let's say, a CPU or a, a computer, actually? Any further ideas? A CPU is probably much faster than a microcontroller. Mm -hmm. So, how can we put it? Low performance? Yeah. Do you have any idea why a microcontroller is intended to be working slower? Maybe power consumption. Yeah. So energy consumption, power consumption. What else? How, how else could you classify a microcontroller? <clears throat> it is very simple in its instructions. Okay, reduced instruction set. Can we say that? Hmm. Is this what you meant? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, but, but what's the reason why it is so small, tiny, low performance, low energy? Because because it works um, in some in some blur in some blur language or something. I don't know the name in English. Oh, some okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, but the main reason is they have to be cheap. Ah. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, you, you cannot build an, an Intel i7 or into a coffee maker because uh, the coffee maker is sold for twenty euros. And the Intel S7 is, uh, i7 is sold for 40 euros itself. So the, 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 the smallest one, or maybe 100 euros. Uh, so um, a microcontroller is, is cheap. Usually everything is on a ship. So the system on a ship is uh, what we can say here. Um, the, the memory is there. There's limited memory. So do you know some examples for microcontrollers, by the way? You already know the... ESP32, which is the one we have sent to you. Um, yeah, let me let me check whether I can show it to you. Uh, give it a try. Second camera. And does it work? No, camera is off. Is it offline? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm going to set this up. Just just wait. Oh, no, that's myself again. This is again me. This is a virtual device, another virtual. It should be, should be here. So let's give it a try, another one. Hmm. Whatever. Um, I think I will. Oh, mama. Maybe it's just too dark. No. Yeah, anyway, um, I'm going to show you later. Um, you have this device here. It's, it has a little microcontroller on the back. Everything is in, in this one, yeah, one chip actually. Um, the, the one that is in the middle, this is the microcontroller. The rest, yeah, I'm going to show you later. So you said STM at mega. I say at mega, yeah, that, that's a good example. 3216, yeah, STM32, or if you are a bit older, you might still know the, um, let me go back to, to the, Jamboard, 
the old um, AT51 mic controller, which is so cheap you can, you can find it on, in most coffee makers. So um, for a coffee maker, you, what, what do we need? We need um, a lot of input and output. So in, usually there's a general purpose input output, which can be used for digital signals and uh, also for, um, yeah, let's say analog input. There's an analog digital converter usually on, on one of those devices. So um, what is the relation between a, or the relationship between a microcontroller and, and IoT? What do you think? You mean difference or what? Uh, no, um, what is the, the, the usage or the how are um, microcontrollers and uh, IoT applications, uh, yeah, how are they related? I just uh, think that uh, mic my microcontrollers are uh, used in IoT, mm -hmm. but actually how? Uh, yeah. Maybe the, what of using the machine learning? Um. Yeah, you can use microcontrollers for machine learning. That, that's true. But uh, in general, uh, Jaroslav said uh, a microcontroller is yeah, adding some computing power to IoT devices. So do you know the typical IoT architecture, by the way? We have, we have sensors and actuators. Um, Usually we have a power supply in the thing. So uh, let this be the, the thing, the smart device or the, 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 the everyday device that's getting, getting smarter. So we, we do have some connection here. So let's say connectivity. Um, so usually wireless, uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a second. And we, we need some, some computing power. And there are several ways to provide this computing power, such as a microcontroller, or you could have a full-fledged CPU, or you could have an ASIC, or you could even have a digital signal processor or something else, so maybe an FPGA uh, there are several variants to, to provide some computing power to, um, to a thing, yeah, to a smart device that, that uh, interacts with the, with the environment. By the way, um, how, would you, how would you describe a sensor? What's a sensor in your own words? It is um, uh, a thing which is used uh, for interaction between between the physical environment and uh, and, uh, and and some other device uh, to register well signals and to output some information. Mm -hmm. So um, a sensor is reading the environment and an actuator. Proce well, it processes. I guess it should. Yeah. It, it changes the environment. So actually, um, sensors are input, actuators are output. Or in a sensor, you read certain parameters of the of the surrounding environment, and with an actuator, you you change the environment. Do you have examples? What what sensors could you have? Uh, the, the easiest, well, the simplest thing uh, that would be a motion sensor, but. Uh, but, but a motion are, sensor, yeah, okay. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean with a motion sensor? Uh, sorry, not sensor, but sense, uh, motion sensor. So if uh, that is uh, installed somewhere, it, uh, it uh, registers if, uh, well, if somebody comes in, you, you get a signal, it, it activates, let's say it activates uh, your light 
when uh, somebody comes uh, and sorts them emotions. Okay. A, a presence sensor, uh, maybe a switch or something, and an infrared presence oh, sensor. And, yeah. and okay. there are plenty of such uh, sensors, like a fingerprint uh, mm -hmm. sensor, which we, re we which we can use, or it is in installed by default in modern computers and uh, well up to date. Uh, in, in order to log in as well as for the smartphones when you want to log in you can use your 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 fring, uh, finger print mm -hmm. mm. and the uh, touch screens they are sensors in uh, in certain way as well so they uh, okay. based on capacitance yeah uh, when you touch it it ch the capacitance changes yeah. You, you, you're right, but uh, in a mobile phone, you have a lot of other sensors. So you have a uh, touchscreen, as what you said. You have, uh, let's say, somehow presence detector or um, switches or something. What else do we have? Uh, temperature sensors. Yeah, temperature, pressure, maybe some gas uh, concentration. So what I... I actually tried to show you, but uh, the second camera here is not probably working right now. Um, let, let's give it another try. No, it's not. Uh, I didn't change anything, so let me let me just see. HDMI output. Yeah, and. A resolution should do. Um, give, give me a second. If you don't see anything, this is the reason is, yeah, maybe I have to remove this part here. Now I'm gone. And again. Um, let's switch on my own video, but not the other one. Now, here we go. So, um, I stay with that one and change this one to the second camera and have to change the camera. Yeah. And yep, here we go. Um, so, we need more light. I have to increase the ISO values and focus. So this is the device we have sent you. Um, you have either this one or that one, so it depends. Um, yeah, there are. Um, some sensors on this one. Um, it's a bit blurry. Okay, better now. Yeah, we should yeah, take. It's, it's good now. It's it should be good now. Uh, it was out of focus. So um, yeah, the, the, this guy actually doesn't have sensors directly, but we can connect a sensor, and. Um, in this case, yeah, let me try to show you that. Um, I've connected a little board with a sensor on it. So there's a um, mechanical electronic system here. Um, and this one connects to an, actually this is an uh, analog digital converter, which has an SPI interface. Um, you see there's SCL and SOA and there's uh, some, some voltage. And you can also um, get out the analog values directly from this board. Um, so this is a development board on a breadboard. This, this part here, the, the white part is called a breadboard. You should have one of those uh, in, in your boxes as well. So this is for, for experimenting with, with microcontrollers and with, with yeah, integrated circuits. And uh, usually they come on a, on a prepared uh, development board. And it, yeah, in, in your case, by the way, um, there are no 
no contacts. So those those contacts here have to be soldered in yourself. Have you ever worked with a soldering iron? Uh, if not, uh, let somebody else do it. Uh, um, don't don't start soldering with that one uh, at the beginning. Uh, but if you have some experience, uh, yeah, you can um, connect the the contacts here, those guys, um, to the uh, to the board. Um, if you want to do that. You don't have to do that for the workshop, but if you want to do that, make sure this little foil here uh, doesn't get too hot. Um, you can remove the display and then flip the display a bit and then you have enough room to, to solder in this those contacts here. Um, and then you can use later on those, it's called a DuPont wire. Um, so you can use those wires to, to connect to the breadboard directly. So. What we, what, where did we start the discussion? Um, this, this is a sensor. So uh, our microcontroller here, uh, our microcontroller here is um, connected to to a sensor or a board with a lot of sensors. And by the way, once again, uh, this this guy here is the microcontroller, and um, it's an ASP32 and uh, there are a lot of contacts at the back and uh, at here some some small contacts and yeah it, it has a lot of input and output. Uh, by the way the rest on the chip uh, this is a USB to serial converter because we do have a USB interface here um, and um, yeah, we also have some some circuitry for the the power supply here. This uh, this board is very very yeah very cute because um, we we can directly connect um, a lithium ion battery to it, and it will will charge the battery uh, correctly, and uh, then you can run everything on a on a little. A rechargeable battery. Uh, on the front side, there is again a display, the one you have seen already. If you power it up, it should. Maybe you have done this um, already. If you power it up, um, I have to plug in the other side as well. Um, it should. It should tell you something already. Let me. Let me just find a free USB port on my PC. Um, no, this one isn't because we have changed the software already in the other workshop. But yeah, on this guy, you should be able to see some output. No, we don't. What's going on? Uh, now we see. Yeah, this way um, it is. It comes with some LoRa software already. On it, and uh, it should it should display something. So there's a display on it. Um, yeah, and I, I'm going to show you how to connect to those devices. Um, what else do we have on the chip? We do have a Bluetooth and um, Wi-Fi uh, included in the system of on a chip. So. The ship on the back includes everything to to run Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. There's a little antenna here, and um, there's another ship. I think it's that one. No, yeah, that one one of the others. Maybe they have put everything on a die. I don't know uh, exactly the the architecture. Uh, is connecting to this to this plug here. It's a UFL connector. There you can put the antenna in. So in this case, it would look like this. You put put the antenna in, and this is the um, the antenna for for LoRa in our case, long range protocol. Uh, in, in case you have one of those, um, there, there's another output or the, another connector for the antenna here. Um, <clears throat> so they work without a pigtail. Um, the reason why you have different devices is we couldn't get enough of one type. So we had to, to order two types and actually there are three types around. 
So we, we are using this for, for our example here. And um, yeah, it, it could work in a, in a real world scenario if you have LoRa connection at home. Um, we are going to talk about this later. So again, um, we have a lot of sensors, we have a lot of actuators. Do you have examples for actuators? Um, I think the uh, actuator is the responsible for uh, controlling the system or the moving or this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but do you have some, yeah, that's right. An actuator is changing the environment. Do you have some examples? So these are microcontrollers, uh, which, uh, which process uh, the, the data, which uh, they get from the sensors. Um, As a, the yeah. computer hard drive stepper, yeah. motor, the, this kind of things, maybe. We, we, we do have a, we do have a microcontroller or CPU or ASIC or DSP or FPGI already, but uh, the actuator is um, connected to that or it is actually connected uh, to, or yeah, it's connected to the microcontroller in our case. So do you have an example for an actuator? Because the actuator itself. As um, yeah. for example, the computer uh, hard drive motor stepper, this kind of things. Yeah, okay. So a motor, a motor yeah. is a general example. Uh, a motor that drives a valve, so opens and closes, to allow air flowing or to allow uh, water flowing or any liquid or a valve in German ventil uh, would do. Uh, a thermal actuator, which is actually uh, heating or something yeah, something that, that uh, uh, heats up if powered up. So maybe you use a relay to, to either drive a motor or you, you use a relay to drive a a lighting system or a heating system. So anything you could imagine that, that switches on and off could be an actuator. Maybe you want to open and close the window. So you use a motor to, to open and close and you might have some, some switches to, to show whether the, the window is open already or is whether the, the drive is uh, reaching the end and you have to stop driving and yeah. Those are examples for actuators. <clears throat> um, what do you think? How much power would a would a, a microcontroller consume in contrast to a CPU, for instance? Uh, what do you think? This this guy we have sent to you. How much power is it consuming? You usually uh, that is uh, five volts, but uh, it, some of them can work on the three point three volts. Yeah, actually the, the microcontroller itself works on 3.3 .3 volts, but uh, I'm connecting it to USB. So there's a, a step down converter from uh, five volts to 3.3 .3 volts on the, on the ship already. So power, power management is implemented. But uh, how about the power consumption? Um, the uh, the amperage is, is, is not uh, high actually. It can, yeah, it, it can work on batteries. Yeah, it can work oh, on batteries and, and it works on, on uh, USB outlets. So uh, it, it just one, needs USB. So USB has 500 milliampere. Amp. No, one, 500 milliampere is the, is the general uh, for, a, for a standard USB port, which is the, the current you can draw from a USB port. Um, so uh, yeah, what's the power then? We have five volts, so it's 2.5 watts. What do you think is the power consumption of a CPU? Uh, mine has uh, 65 watts. 65 watts, so it's getting very hot. It, it needs a lot of cooling, actually. You have either air cooling or you have a little cool tower on top of your CPU. You have those um, um, yeah, glue that... that um, thermally transports the, the, the heat. Um, you have maybe water cooling or oil cooling even in, in some cases you want to overclock your CPU for instance. Uh, so there's a lot of more, more power needed. This guy uh, could go into deep sleep mode for instance. Deep sleep mode means um, it, it uh, 
consumes less than let's say five milliwatts or less. So actually uh, it's down, going down to the nanowatt range. If you remove all the LEDs on the ship, uh, uh, the, the the power LED, for instance, you can you can get it down to yeah some nano watts or nano ampere actually. Um, then yeah, it can stay. Uh, I, I, um, let's let's assume you want to run this as a smoke detector. You don't want to change batteries every two days or so. So what you do is uh, you you put it into deep sleep mode, activate it, let's say once every five seconds or 10 seconds, um, put a lot of energy in a large battery and then you can run this device for let's say 10 years in a smoke detector or in a, in a flooding con uh, detector or anything that, that monitors the environment. Um, the problem here or the, the biggest energy consumption comes from the from the display actually. So the display needs a lot of energy in this device. Um, yeah, so this actually explains the thing. The sensors are connected. Let's, let's say with a coffee machine, the sensors connect to the, to the water level sensor um, the sensor connects to, or the sensors are buttons on the on the coffee machine, and uh, yeah, what are the actuators? There's a relay um, switching on and off the the heating of of the coffee machine. That's the maybe the, the heating for the water and the heating for the for the uh, cup actually. So for the for the for the bottle underneath the the where, where the coffee drips in. Um, and yeah, this this is just two actuators and let's say four sensors, and you can run this on a very small, let's say eighty fifty one mic controller, which is sold for less than fifty cents, or yeah, very very cheap. So you can't the the chip is cheaper than yeah some actual uh, hardware, some, some more uh, conventional hardware. Um, by the way, have you ever heard what, is, what, a, what a FPGA is and what an ASIC is? Ever heard those terms? Who, who of you has ever seen one or have seen those abbreviations? An ASIC is a an application specific integrated circuit. So you don't program it usually, you you put a lot of, uh, let's say, digital um, gates such as AND, OR, XOR together. And uh, yeah, you, you put the program into hardware. A digital signal, pro digital signal processor is something you use for, let's say, waking up your smart speaker or uh, yeah, something that runs on a stream of data. And an FPGA is a field programmer uh, gate array, uh, which, uh, which means, yeah, you can, you can put together your application in terms of, uh, for your application, you can use um, those, those gates such as and or x or and so on um, and uh, you connect those to a digital circuit that performs very well for your purpose but and very fast uh, for instance you can find them in yeah, graphics adapters in your in your pc there's usually an fpga and, and a graphics adapter to run very fast and do a lot of shading uh, for for 3d gaming for instance um do you have examples for connectivity which is the second part here um so, so Wi-Fi connectivity examples for protocols yeah. yep Telnet protocol. Yep. Very. Not very safe. Any 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 low level protocols? So we have been talking about LoRa, for instance. Let's say LoRaWAN as a 
higher level protocol, there's Zigbee, for instance. There might be Z-Wave, which is the one we talked about. Um, there That's might be right. KNX, for instance. There might be Bluetooth Low Energy or Wi-Fi. Anything like that uh, would, would do. Um, yeah, what, what's the, if, if you think on those, uh, if you think about those protocols, what is the, the motivation to use specific protocols and not, in most cases, not, not Wi-Fi, um, which is available in most cases, so. Sorry, you are muted now. Uh, yes. I know, I, I talked to someone else. Could you no? repeat the question? Pardon, pardon, what do you say? Uh, the, the motives to use those protocols is again, energy consumption though, they have to be very small. There are some higher layer protocols such as, let's say MQTT, which is for um, yeah, publish subscribe mechanisms. There's something like the constraint object application protocol, um, which is yeah, kind of a replacement for HTTP. Yes, of course you can use HTTP here, but HTTP is a very heavyweight protocol. Yeah? So in general, um, some, some lightweight protocols are being used. Um, yeah. Again, energy consumption is a, yeah, is a key concern here. Okay, so we have a gateway and then usually in our IoT scenario, there's something yeah, there's the internet um, or maybe something that is summarized as the cloud. And yeah, we have some, some services here. Um, so what we do have is we have things, connectivity, services. Uh, we also have data analyzers as a key uh, component. So there we have, let's say, maybe you have heard, or yeah, again, pub MQTT, or you have heard something about um, publish, uh, sorry, um, MapReduce or a Lambda architecture. Maybe you have used or have heard those terms in, in that, that scenarios. Um, yeah, this is a typical IoT scenario. We have a think, a smart everyday device, usually coming with a microcontroller, CPU, any, any of those computing mechanisms. We have connectivity, um, low performance, low bandwidth, low energy or uh, connectivity such as Bluetooth, low energy, Wi-Fi, LoRaWAN, ZigBee, Z-Wave, KNX, whatever. We have usually a gateway. Um, here we usually have something like HTTP or um, IP based protocols. And uh, yeah, we have services, data analyzers, it's long-term data analyzers. We have a lot of data getting in. This is a typical IoT scenario. Um, by the way, how about security here? Where could be an attacker? An attacker could be here in, the, in that area, intercepting your, your radio transmissions. An attacker could be on your mobile device, on your thing already, or yeah, the attacker could, could have physical access to the thing. Or an attacker could be here and yeah, intercept all the, all the messages. Um, let's, let's talk about some, some general, um, yeah, considerations. So, so 
what what uh, could an attacker do? Let me let me see if I forget something. Yes, I did forget something. Sorry, um, and it's already here. Uh, let let me let me come back to the to the uh, sorry. Uh, let me come back to the to the um, to the microcontroller. This is an ESP32, as you see here. Um, it comes with a core and memory. So there's a microprocessor on it, actually 32 bits. It can, has dual, it can have dual core up to uh, 400 megahertz and more. Uh, it has some flash memory, usually RAM, SRAM. Uh, it has connections, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Uh, there's some radio uh, on the chip as well. There are some uh, components necessary for uh, or helpful in, in uh, cases where you need encryption. There's RSA, which is an asymmetric encryption algorithm. There's SHA for hash functions, AES, symmetric encryption, and there's a random number generator because you usually uh, need keys. Um, and it is very hard to get a key or a random number uh, from a from a microcontroller if there's no input, if there's no user interaction. So if you need a random number, you have to provide some, let's say, entropy. And you can, you can use the, the keyboard, you can use a microphone. If there are no such devices to, to have anybody entering random numbers or entering or giving input to a random number generator, it's very hard. So you have to have, let's say, a, a physical device that, that generates some noise and some true noise, which you can use for, for random numbers. There's an I2C interface, which is a serial interface. There's an SPI interface up here, which is another serial. There's another serial interface. There are uh, infrared uh, drivers already implemented. Um, the ESP32 comes, also comes with a CAN bus uh, um, piece of hardware, CAN bus is a field bus. It has an internal temperature sensor. Yeah, it has um, some, some internal components which enable it to, to um, connect a touchscreen directly to it that, that runs directly on it, a pulse width modulator, which can be used for instance to set the, the brightness of LEDs. Um, yeah, it even has Ethernet hardware on it if it's used and a digital analog converter and an analog digital converter. So in, in both directions. Um, and yeah, just, just to um, show you something more, let's say I'm going to show you the pin out. Um, yeah, let's, let's get the right one. Yeah, this, this one looks good. Um, oh, where, where are we? It's not loading here, sorry. Again, give it another try. Yep. Hopefully it's readable. And uh, let me add one more here. Uh, it shows the, the pin out. Uh, poor quality. Let, let me grab another one. Uh, I I have it in the in the other lecture, but I can't copy it from there because it's not working. It's only one way. You you can put it onto onto this one. Yeah, now now I have one. Okay, though so this is this is better. Um, what we do have. We have a lot of input output pins and um, there's something which is very specific to 
uh, this device is or to ESP32 is that you can actually internally rewire most outputs to most of the pins or most input outputs to, to most of the pins. So uh, if you have such a pin here, which is connected to the, to the ship, uh, you can say, yeah, whether this is a general purpose input output or an analog digital converter, and you can, you can even uh, change the, the, the internal yeah, wiring. The, the problem here is we, we need, usually we need a lot of input output, but uh, we don't have so many pins. We don't want to have so many pins on the, on the ship. So um, depending on the specific application, we internally say, yeah, let's this be a general purpose input output and let's uh, that guy be a touch uh, screen interface or a button interface. And uh, yeah, in our case, some of them are already used for LoRa, for instance, those are connected to SPI interfaces. Um, the OLED screen is already connected. So um, those pins have been used, but if you don't need the, the OLED screen, you can still use it as an analog digital converter or as a general purpose input output. So zero or 3.3 volts input output, digital input output um, yeah, interface. Um, so, and now again, Sorry guys for, I, I forgot this, um, about the keys um, and about the security. What, what, what is security? What do we want? What does security mean? In our, in our application, let's say we want to, um, yeah, we want to distribute or, or we want to deliver um, certain values over the internet. We want to measure temperature in the room. We want to um, control the heating. So there's a valve which allows the heat going in and out. And uh, yeah, what do you think? What, what do we need in terms of security? What do we want? Requirements, let's call this requirements. Uh, well, if there are some uh, sensors, uh, perhaps uh, at least uh, to prevent uh, them from physical damage, uh, if, uh, if we think that, uh, that it can happen. Mm -hmm. and, well. Okay, physical damage. I can say we want availability. Right? Yes. I think, uh, can I add, if we talk about data security? Yeah. So integrity and uh, confidentiality. Okay, integrity. What does it mean? <laughs> that it uh, works uninterrupted. Yeah, uh, it works uninterrupted as availability, I would say. But integrity is something else. Well, it, it, it was not a tampered with, it was, uh, well, there is no man in the middle. Yeah, it, it hasn't changed. Uh, so information has not been changed while it is traveling or while it is being stored on a memory. Um, how, can you, how can you implement integrity or how can you increase integrity or how can you guarantee or try to guarantee integrity? You have to check uh, your networks uh, if uh, there are no strangers online who <laughs> are trying uh, to, well, just sniff the packages. Okay, so physical access would be an example. Prevent physical access. But in general, you have, let's say, hash values or s checksums. So in general, a checksum. Okay. So if you talk about integrity, it means Pardon? in case of hash ACRS, that uh, not everybody can change the data. Yeah, every, not everyone can read the data, though this is confidentiality, right? Okay. okay, so this is a different requirement, confidentiality. So I hope 
the spelling is right, confidentiality. Um, check some, it should be. Um, yeah, we can send twice or three times multiple transmissions. Anything like that would increase integrity or would uh, yeah, improve integrity. Uh, how about confidentiality? How can we re, uh, how can we achieve this? There's a passwords and uh, and the login and names. Uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, so access control. And if you say password, it could also be encryption. Encryption. Maybe hiding of information. But usually this is not what we do in computer science. Um, and how about authenticity? What does it mean? Uh, it, it means, uh, well, which, uh, which I have mentioned uh, a while ago, it means, uh, well, uh, identifying a user. Mm -hmm. So guaranteeing that a user is the right person. So the user claims something, I, I am Thomas, and um, yeah, you have to identify the user. How can you do that? Maybe you need some symbol or something for proving this one. I'm here and this is me. Yeah, uh, you said a thing or what was the first word I did? I, I missed. Uh, I said um, you need something as a some symbol or how can I explain it? You know, a possession. Yeah, this kind of something. I think it's with double S and all the time, yeah. So possession, you need to have a physical key, for instance. Yes, yes. You need to have a smart card. Yeah, yeah this kind, maybe you want access to company. Uh, if the receptionist is not here, you need to prove it, I'm here. This is mm -hmm. me, I'm the worker of this company. Okay, a smart card, a, a, yeah. a physical key. Yeah. A physical key is something you have in possession. What else would work? have an idea can I ask for example if analyze system so to make uh, authenticity we just put a password and login it is work in this case or not mm -hmm. so this is knowledge the password is basically knowledge yeah um, if you look at your passport or your ID card there are some biometric information on it. Yeah, Bio biometric information. Biometry. Also. Biometry. So is it that way? No. How's it spelled? <laughs> Let's make biometric. it biometric info. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct. Um, so you can have, let's say, how you look like. Um, the color of your eyes, your iris, the structure of your, of the, of the little, yeah, of, of the iris itself. So if you look in the mirror, you can see a little of structure. The, the retina, which is the, the background of your eye, um, contains some, some veins, some blood structures filled with blood. And you can see that fingerprint, typical example, hand geometry, would also work. Uh, the way you, how you type, the way how you speak, the way, yeah, your signature is, is very... How you walk. Yeah. Pardon? Gate. Gate authentication is also biometric. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also gate. Okay. Let, let's go back to the first uh, question. How can you, how can you prove over a network? everything is over a network here, yeah? that you are in possession of, let's say your, or anything, that you, are, that you are in possession of anything. How can you prove that over a network? You can make use of a public and a private key. Mm. Okay. 
So you put the private key on the device? No, you publish your, your public key and you have your own private key. Therefore, when you when someone encrypts your message okay. uh, the, with your public key, you're the only one who can encrypt it. By the way, I hope it's not burning. <laughs> I could hear the... the yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sirene, siren, siren. Yeah. Um, no, no problem. No need to say sorry, but <laughs> I, I hope you, uh, your 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 office isn't burning, isn't on fire. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, how can we prove? Let Let's go back. How can we prove that we are in possession of something? Um, yeah. Maybe we have a challenge response or something. Have you heard about this? So um, there's the claimant, somebody who wants to get access and there's the server. So what's the claimant sending to the server? Yeah, a request, I want access. Then the server is sending a challenge, which is actually a random number then the, the challenge is somehow encrypted with the private key of the claimant. The result is being sent as a response. And uh, yeah, the core requirement is that this is used one time only in order to avoid a replay attack. And then, um, this guy checks. Um, it is not necessary to have the private key here. It can also be a pre-shared key. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the problem usually is if you use a pre-shared key and a challenge, uh, then you, and you know the challenge, then you can uh, deduct or deduce, deduce actually uh, the um, the private key or the, the pre-shared key actually. Uh, so a private key is preferable because uh, it can be checked with the uh, public key and uh, the reverse, the, the function is, is not reversible brute force. So yeah. Um, this is a challenge response scheme, which we can use down here for authentication, for knowledge or possession. How can you, how can you prove that you are in possession of your mobile phone, for instance? I I could, yeah. You can, for example, uh, I, I just know how it works, for example, for me, that when I call as an operator of my uh, mobile phone, he asked me to tell about the last uh, three calls uh, which I made. And if I, and uh, when I told them, uh, he told me, okay, Yaroslav, you are the uh, owner of this phone. So yeah, you, you can send him something or you can use a, yep one-time password generator. So I, I hope I can get it in focus. Uh, you, you probably know this. Uh, it, it shows a lot of random numbers. Mm, now I am out of focus. Um, actually, the numbers are not random. Are not really random. Um, numbers are generated on your phone. Uh, there's a key together with um, yeah, the current time and um, a hash value is being calculated. And then let's say the last six digits of the hash value are being shown on the, on the screen. And I can enter those numbers uh, on, the, on the server. We can use the same algorithm and then uh, yeah, we can, we can um, what can we do? We, we, we can 
tell whether uh, the um, the user is in possession of the phone because we can calculate the same value. Okay, so pos possession can be proved by either yeah, a challenge response scheme or by providing one-time um, passwords or so on. Um, so finally, let's talk about the attacker. What does the attacker want to do? His motives or motivations. Any idea? Let's let's assume you you want to to attack well, an the, IoT the system. The motivation can be simple, either financial financial motivation or just you want to to revenge or just you want Money. to yeah. Okay, you're right. Yeah, some personal uh, personal likes or dislikes. Like, uh, well, you 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 want to revenge. You feel bad about some person and okay. or some company. Revenge. Um, let's say self glorification. Can we put it that way? Sure. Yeah. Um, money. Um, we are a competition. Whatever. Some sensitive information. Um, what do you mean? Some sensitive information? Uh, so we talk about the confide confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So it's also hiding some information about you. Okay. And so he, maybe he's curious. Yeah. Yeah. Curiosity. Yeah. Curiosity might be a motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, there, there might be some, some political reasons. Maybe even a terrorist or something. They usually want to change the world in her favor. Maybe religious reason, whatever. So... Uh, there are a lot of motivations for an attacker. So, if we go back to to our scenario, um, yeah, I think I think we we will we can talk about um, yeah how can we how can we prevent the attacker from being successful? We can how can we prevent this guy? from, let's say, knowing the keys. Um, there are obviously some keys here and the same keys might be here or here. So uh, if we use encryption, we need key material. We have either symmetric or asymmetric keys. We might have session keys. Um, so we have to prevent those keys here or we have to protect those keys. We have them we have to prevent any access to them. Any idea how we can prevent a key from being stolen from a mobile device? Well, use secure secure network. So if you are logged on a, on a Wi-Fi, it has to be a, a secure a hotspot. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in order to be secure, we need keys on both sides to run the encryption. And the question is, the keys are being stored somewhere in a mobile device. So, I can show you there are keys in that device right now. How can I get it out? How can I read the key from this device? And on the other hand, how can I protect the key in that device so that I don't want... Uh, that no one else can can read the keys from this device. Have you heard the term eight, um, hardware security module, for instance? Maybe a smart card uh, that does not allow anyone to read the keys. Um, 
maybe you have uh, smart passports or smart ID cards. And usually they, they have um, some key material in it. And um, yeah, it is protected in a way that the only way to get it is to yeah, to open the ship and to use brute force in terms of use to, to slide off parts of it and use electron microscopes to see the keys inside those devices. So making sure no one can read the keys is uh, the reason to do this is to protect the confidentiality by not letting an attacker reading the keys, especially those keys who are used in more than one device. So making sure that keys are unique for a particular device is a key requirement, is a requirement for key storage in a mobile scenario. By the way, um, let's assume the following. You have a Wi-Fi network. You have any smart device such as a uh, network controllable light in your front yard in your garden. So you have to give that device out of your own flat, outside your own flat, your keys. Who of you has set up or would set up a separate Wi-Fi network just for those devices which are not under control all the time? Most people don't do that. But uh, it would be a key requirement to, to make sure no one can steal the keys from the device. Because if the key if the Wi-Fi password is stored in the device, somebody could steal the password by stealing the device and uh, opening it. And the problem is, uh, gets, gets worse if the device contains a, uh, contains a, let's say, um, an interface to that key. If you have, let's say, a, an API to read the key, if, if you have a command to, to print the key somewhere. Somebody mentioned Telnet, for instance, or so. Uh, we have to make sure no one can get the key only by connecting to the device. We have to make sure it needs a lot of effort. And for that, hardware security modules are usually the, uh, the solution. Or we change the key frequently. If we change the key every, let's say, five seconds, uh, if someone steals the key, it becomes invalid for the next transmission. Um, how about that guy here? Yeah, we have to make sure the network itself is protected. So we have to prevent men in the middle attacks. We have to prevent replay attacks and so on. And the same here for that guy. Uh, if, it's, if that guy is attacking the network, uh, the wired network, we have to make sure that guy isn't able to run man in the middle or whatever. And uh, we have to make sure he's not able to get the keys uh, in, the, in the application server. Okay, so I think we have, we deserve a small break. And uh, we meet again at, let's say, 10.55. Yeah, 50 minutes break, 10.55. See you then, I stop the recording for now. And yeah, see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Um, welcome back. And here we are again. Um, so what's the plan for the, for the second part of the session? Um, the first let me, let me just conclude what we did. We talked about IoT architectures. We talked about microcontrollers because we have one. We talked about key materials. We talked about attackers. We talked about um, motivations. We talked about uh, yeah, our requirements in terms of security. And I'm going to start the recording again. Is it recording? Yes, it's still recording. So we have to cut out the middle part. Welcome back to the afternoon. Um, so what we want to do now is uh, we want to, to play around with, with a device. Um, we want to use it in a specific scenario. And um, 
we also want to sorry uh, we also want to to set it up to work in a yeah, long range iot scenario um here we go sorry technical problem no not again and yep i'm sharing the screen here um number six seven here we are uh iot uh uses specific protocols and we want to use LoRaWAN as, as an IoT protocol. Why do we want to use LoRaWAN? Because our device has one interface for that, has, an, has a radio on it. So we have the thing again, maybe a sensor in it. We measure something, we use a gateway we use LoRa here. The gateway is connected to a network server. I'm going to show you how to set this up. And then we do have an application server where we can deal with the data. So, Again, we have key material, we have a network key here and here, network key, and we have an application key, which is providing encryption here. So um, we have two encryption domains, one is between uh, the thing the mobile device and the network. And the second one is between uh, the mobile device and the application end-to-end -end encryption. That means anyone, any attacker sitting in between those uh, cannot access the data. Uh, okay, um, how can we do that? Um, I'm going to show you something. Um, yeah, how to set up the device and then uh, we also talk about who provides the, net, the, the gateway functionality to us. Um, there's one community network, which I have mentioned, which is called the Things Network. And um, yeah, as a community network, it is run by some, let's say, enthusiasts. They set up a lot of devices everywhere. Um, yeah. There is definitely some, or there are definitely some devices in Barcelona, I guess. Is it down here somewhere? Yeah, you see there are some gateways already placed. Um, but I'm not sure about Magdeburg. And um, but I, 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 I would assume there is coverage in Magdeburg as well. So, Where is it? Uh, Wolfsburg, no, the other way. Magdeburg, yeah, there are some gateways. Um, so there should be coverage and let's go to another area. Uh, I have to locate it. Uh, Lyof is somewhere here, isn't it? No. Um, this bip, bip, low contrast Kiev, okay, no, nope. further to the east. Uh, okay, maybe you have coverage. Um, it depends where you are. So, um, there are some devices, okay, indoor usually doesn't help much, indoor again. Indoor again, indoor again. So in case uh, it doesn't work, you have to go to uh, one of those locations to the vicinity to test it, or you can set up your own gateway. And uh, let's have a look on the Baltic states. 
uh, just just an overview. So you said Riga. There's a lot, a lot of devices in Estonia, and yeah, Riga looks good as well. So indoor again, outdoor, yeah. Um, the Things Network provides access to or provides the gateways actually users provide them and the network servers and in some cases even even application server so what we are going to do here is we, we log in um, and um, I'm showing you the console so we have uh, we, we run a gateway it's not connected unfortunately let me let me grab one um, yeah, this this is the device here, um, my my indoor gateway because I don't have coverage here, um, and then yeah, I simply have to plug it in, and hopefully then it is being connected. Yep. Uh, power outlet is hard to reach here, and it's connecting to my Wi-Fi network now. Hopefully, yeah, it's blinking. And it should should come online here. Um, gateways not connected yet. There's something going on in the chat. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah, it depends. Um, you can always set up your own gateway. This is what I'm trying to do actually. Uh, now it's connected, yeah. This is the gateway I have here. Um, yeah, I, I've placed it in my office. I, I've stolen it from the office actually. Uh, so no, I, I haven't stolen it. I, I brought it from my office home. I'm living somewhere up here. And uh, yeah, this gateway shows, or is, is an indoor gateway. It's, it's not outdoor right now but uh, it's sufficient for our experiments. Um, I can see even the traffic here and let me, let me connect yeah. a device here. And then we can see some traffic uh, passing by the gateway. So this is the internet. Um, we should see some encrypted traffic here after I have set up a device that's coming online and let's see whether it's sending something oh come on yeah so uh, this is the traffic we have a join message uh, if you look in my into my my second talk uh, I am explaining how join messages work and what's going on there. So what we see here is the the traffic passing this gateway. Uh, we have some physical um, parameters. We have the frequency, for instance. There are several frequencies being defined by the Things Network. So there's a frequency range. Every frequency here can be used in parallel. There are eight channels, I guess. Uh, or I remember there's the bandwidth, the spreading factor, which is used to yeah, control the um, the modulation. Um, so if I'm further away, I'm sending in a more robust uh, modulation, more stable connection. This is the payload, obviously being encrypted. And um, yeah, I, I also see some information about, uh, let's say, in a, in a real message, I, I also see some signal to noise ratio and some RSSI receiver signal strength indicator. Um, so if I am um, holding the antenna now in, in my fist, I'm, I'm doing this. This is the antenna I'm, I'm having in my fist here. Um, it should go down. Let's see. Um, yeah, now it's minus 74. Uh, and this one is minus 66. And now I'm removing my fist. The next one should be better. Going up 
again. This is the next one, I guess. And we are back at minus 51. Let me place the antenna in a better position. So it should go up even more now. Um, yeah, minus 45. This is if the antenna is not obstructed. Um, there's a device address. And um, yeah, this is what I see on the gateway. This is what I see here in the network. Um, so it's an uplink and downlink channel. Currently only one direction is being used because I have no messages for that device. Um, so the uplink is being used. And yeah, we, we, get, we get a message every, let's say 12 or 13 seconds or so. Um, and all those messages are going through my, my gateway here. If there, are, if there would be other stations around, I could see them as well. Yeah, I've, I'm switching on the, the other device um, that came pre-configured. So let's see whether there is some signal. Yeah, this device is joining. Uh, I'm pulling on the antenna. Um, this is the other device, so it's it's working here as well. The payload is something we can't read. Um, and again, yeah, this was the first one. So now it's sending something from time to time. Um, yeah, let me switch it on. Yeah, the device ID says it is, uh, FEFF -F at the end, and this is the right device. So this is what I see on the on the Things network. Um, then, in a, to to prepare anything, I set up an application. In this case, um, if you remember, there's an application server. Um, I define an application. I can either use my own application server, or use some so-called integrations here. I've set up such a an application two years ago actually and what I get here is uh, let me power on the other device because we need some traffic later on. Uh, what we see here is um, yeah an overview. We have four registered devices. A couple of them are online so this one is the one I have here two minutes ago, it has sent something. Um, actually, it should send something now in a couple of seconds. Uh, let's see. And uh, yeah, we get we get the data. And actually, this is the, the plain text data. So because the sensor isn't currently uh, connected, I get a minus one as a sensor readout. I'm going to show you the source code and uh, yeah, how to get the data. And yeah, this is being sent and this is being decrypted. Um, so it's not encrypted anymore. I can, I can read the value here. And we also get, um, we also get yeah, the time stamp. And usually we should also get some information. Let's see whether it's connecting three minutes ago. No, it's not connecting. What's going on here? A reset is necessary. Okay. Do we get some new data? Yes, we do. We get some more data. Uh, we also get um, yeah the gateway ID. So this is my gateway. Um, there could be more more than one gateways. Uh, if there are more than one gateways, we can use this even for to locate the mobile device roughly because um, yeah, if there are three gateways around, we can tell the, the signal quality or the, the signal strengths between uh, the mobile device and the, the gateway. And then we can estimate the position of the mobile device. Uh, in this case, there's only one. So we only have the signal strengths, but as it is minus 51, I assume it is in the closed vicinity of, of my device here my gateway so I can roughly uh, 
tell that this device is currently in my home. Um, yeah, again, it delivers the values. And what can we do with the values? Um, this is a device in the application. We can uh, use, for instance, an integration. In, in my case, I'm storing everything in a database. So everything is stored for up to seven days in a database and another application picks up the data from there. What we wanted to do is we use the sensor, which is a sensor for ammonium. We detect the ammonium concentration. Um, remember ammonium stinks terrible and uh, yeah, we wanted to find out whether the, um, the cleaner or whether there's a natural source uh, of, of the smelling in our offices or in our building or whether there's some um, yeah, artificial source, some human uh, induced uh, action that, that causes the smelling. Um, so we collect this data and we have, sent, we have sent it to the database and from the database we have um, received the data and used it in our own um, yeah, application. You remember uh, I've shown you the, the power consumption of the coffee machine at the end of one of the lectures. So this is the same application we use for uh, collecting the um, ammonium concentration. So you set up a, uh, an integration here. You can, yeah, let's, let's just add one. Uh, we have some integrations available, for instance. So the, the simplest one is, uh, let's say, HTTP. Uh, whenever a telegram arrives from the mobile device, we can we can set it up to to call a, a URL. So if you put your own URL in here, your own host in here, you will get a post request whenever there's a telegram arriving with all the information above this uh, about this telegram. Um, yeah, what else can we do? Um, there's another integration, let's say, um, have you heard about if this, then that, IFTTT? Uh, you can use this to integrate several IoT services. So for instance, this is a, a web service. You can, you can run um, or you can, you can collect your emails there. And whenever you get an email, maybe you, you want to switch on a lamp at home, a light at home. So um, what you can do is um, set up a gateway there or set up an application there or a rule based system, a rule there um, that whenever you receive a message, uh, this message um, later on, uh, yeah, if you receive an email message, uh, the rule is uh, yeah, call somebody at home. So call, call your device API, call your smart home API and, and switch on the light. So you have to connect both to if this and that. This is a yeah, cool service. Um, I think it's commercial, but uh, available on the internet. You know that? Shake your hands. So no, um, IFTT t.com i guess so everything works better together get your echo device talking to email whatever so you can set up a lot of of rules here connect everything with everything um, so this would be a nice integration http is the easiest one there are others open sensors uh, mapping my devices whatever um yeah the payload that arrives here if this and this provides some decoding and converting facilities in this case it's being converted um yeah it is a string that comes in and this is this one is being converted to our external format yeah and my device is constantly sending something now and unfortunately, it's only sending minus one because I haven't connected the sensor uh, directly, but it, it, it would uh, deliver. So this is the server side. Um, everything at the end is stored in this database. Uh, let's go there. Um, let me authorize. Yeah, sorry, I have to go back here. 
use that key here, copy it, use it up here, authorize. Again, yeah, I am authorized and now I should be able to query the data. Um, try it out. So what I get is the same values here in the database. So my ESP32-2, which is the device I've set up, is sending yeah, currently minus one as a value. Maybe we have some historic data. Uh, no, it only uh, stores the last seven days. Um, so it only starts a couple of, yeah, actually this is today's data only. Um, so everything is stored and can be read. And uh, yeah, I can even get a device list. And I get those two devices, which are currently being registered for the service. And you can you can uh, query it by by sending some yeah, HTTP request. This is a post request. Curl is a command line utility to set to send a an HTTP post request or an HTTP request. So it's a command line uh, web browser, if you want to say. This is the URL. Tom's Playground is my application. And uh, yeah, they they run a little, how's it called? A little, yeah, data storage a um, that rolls over. So after a week, everything is removed and the new data gets in. It's a little buffer. We use that buffer for our own purposes. So we, we, we request data from there. <clears throat> um, yeah, let's go again to a device, which is the one we have here. Um, we have to set it with an app key because the application currently is running on the Things Network itself. Um, so I don't, uh, yeah, I'm able to, to get the app key here because uh, it's not end to end. It, it is end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted, but the other end is not in my hand. So actually, in, in terms of security, this is a bit of a weakness. Um, but anyway, I trust those guys, so I can put the application key in here, and currently we don't have any sensible data. And the network key is specific to that device, but uh, it is being shared between all the um, all the users because uh, everyone is connected to the same network, in this case, the Things Network. So this is for the, uh, remember, this is for the encryption between the network key and the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the thing and the network server. So this, this part is for uh, the network key and the application key is here. And currently the application server is also running on the Things Network on there on their servers. Yeah. Example code, you get it down here or you can you can get it via this in this format. And you have to make sure, by the way, um, there's little endian, big endian, you might have heard this typical architectures or microcontroller architectures or CPU architectures uh, either use a little Endian or big endian, so it depends whether the least significant bit is first, or the, in this case, the most significant bit is first. So I can change the order. Uh, it it puts in the 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 bytes in a different order, and uh, yeah, you have to tell whether you have MSB first or LSB first. Bit order and byte order both are important in this case. The device ID is specific to your device. And the application uh, ID is our own application here. So we tell this device uh, that all the data goes to this application and the application has a unique ID for that. So whenever I transfer something, whenever I send something, uh, it doesn't matter which gateway receives it, but the network server knows because it knows the application ID, it knows to which application server it forwards the message. So wherever I am on earth, actually in the Things Network, North America, Ukraine, wherever, uh, the data is being sent to this particular application here. 
because we, we have an application ID. Okay, so far for, for this part and now we have to program our device. And I'm going to show you, yeah, let, let's start here. Uh, if you want to do the same, you, I, I'm using the Arduino IDE integrated development environment. Um, I think Andreas is in his course is, or in his workshop, he's, he's using a different uh, one. I'm using the Arduino IDE here because it's very simple. Um, you go to this side, Arduino is, yeah, they, they are manufacturing their own microcontrollers, their own development boards, a lot of input outputs, uh, very cheap. And um, yeah, if you go to, to software downloads, you can download the Arduino IDE, Integrated Development Environment, for your own platform. In my case, it's Mac OS. Uh, it could be also Windows, um, Linux, or you can get the source code. If you have any other operating system than one of those three, you probably know how to, to build your own code or your own uh, applications because usually you have to do that because nothing uh, comes prepared for that. So I downloaded this and then um, I'm sharing the entire screen now and then I'm, I'm able to start the Arduino IDE and it looks like this. Um, you have a, a, an editor for your current, it's called a sketch for your current program. Uh, if it starts, usually it comes up with, with those setup. Uh, with those, with this code already, there's the setup function and the loop function. Setup is run once you start the device, and loop is, um, yeah, the the software that runs on the device permanently. So let me connect one of those um, development boards here. Um, you then have to set up the right port. Let's check whether it found this one. Yeah, now it found this one. In my case, it's named that like this. If you have Windows, it might be COM4 or COM5 COM or something. So the so-called COM port. Um, you might even have a different name for that on, on a Linux system. In my case, it's connected to that port. And if I connect to that port, yeah, I can see there's something coming from the device. You have to set up the right baud rate here. Um, and this is a network scanner running here. So what we did is actually we used an example, go down. Ah, yeah, you have to do one thing before that. Uh, you have to set up the right device. So you go usually go to board manager and you either have, um, this Heltec LoRa device. So let's search for it. Yeah, this one. Um, or you have a TT Go, which is the, the bigger device. This one, uh, depending on what you got. Um, if it doesn't find anything, um, the problem might be that you have to set up for the particular device, you have to set up um, a download source and an additional URL to download the bot description. So in this case, I have set up this URL. Uh, this is for the, the smaller one, the white one. Um, so directly downloaded from China, uh, we download the device description and then this device will appear, um, sorry, this device will appear here. Um, if you, if you, if you run the board manager, you can, you can install it. Sorry. Hello. Uh, I would like to show, hello. Okay. Now I see it's compiling. So that's why it's busy. 
Give it some time. I ac accidentally press the compile button. Okay. There are some warnings. We ignore that. It's just a warning. But yeah, in the board manager, we can set up the right board. We, we install it, we update to the right version. So whatever board you have, then in this case, oh, I don't want that. Uh, in this case, we go to examples, for instance. Uh, this is what we, do, we, are, we have done. I have used one of those examples. Um, this is the example. It sets up a serial interface. It sets up the, the Wi-Fi module. For that, we have to include a header file. Uh, and then in the loop, it prints scan start. It scans the network. Uh, scan is done. If the number of networks found is zero, it prints no networks found. If else, if it found something, then uh, it pr uh, prints in this for loop, it prints all the networks we have. And um, yeah, how do we do that? We press upload. So everything is being compiled. Hopefully it works. Um, if there are some libraries miss missing, you have to set up library. You can do that here, manage libraries. Um, we are coming back to this soon. But the example here should work. So now it's being uploaded to the mobile device. Um, now it's being reset and we can use the serial monitor to see the output. And this is what the program, the program's output. It's not using the display. It's not using anything. It's just printing out my network. So I think this is my network and um, this is what the neighbors have. Um, so this one is obviously in the same room. This one is further away and this one is even further away. So maybe the next neighbor or in the next house or something. Okay, so, and now we are going to program this device to, set, to send some um, messages to the IoT network, to the Things network. In this case, we include a lot of libraries. For instance, this one is for the display. UAG2lib. Um, if you want to, you can find the, the source code but you have to adapt it. You can find the source code in the event description in insight.sati.school. Um, yeah, we have to um, manage the libraries. We have to set up some libraries. So let's say you want to run LoRa on your device. You can search for LoRa. And um, yeah, I'm using currently using a specific library. Uh, it's called Elmic, so I can search directly for Elmic. Um, this is this one here, and this one is actually, uh, no, this one is installed. There are several versions, so uh, you have to play around with the versions. Um, sm uh, smart advice, um, you have to set up the right frequency settings. So for Europe, it should be 868 megahertz. For North America, Asia, it should be 910. Um, I'm not sure about Russia. They have different frequencies. I'm not sure uh, Ukraine. Uh, yeah, you have to find out where the gateways are, uh, on which frequency or which frequencies, which Bandwidth has been assigned to uh, LoRaWAN to the general public, actually. So, yeah, you have to make sure it is legal to use the right frequency. Uh, I'm using this library, as I said. Um, it's a development by IBM. The, the original one is here. So this is a newer version. This one stops with 1.5.0. And here we have 3.2 already. Uh, I have installed 3.0.99. 
I don't press update because usually it, it stops running. So just for the experiments, uh, we stay with that. Uh, but uh, you can you can always install the, the newest version. This is the display, as I said, and this is the library for uh, for LoRa for LoRaWAN. SPI is for the serial interface. This one as well. This library here is for the analog digital converter. Adafruit is a yeah, kind of a non-profit company, a non-profit profit organization, um, developing a lot of uh, yeah, devices and they come up with their own libraries. So we have an analog digital converter. Uh, then we have the, the keys, the network session key. So it's not over the air activation. This is what we got from the, from the user interface. So um, the network session key, this is what we, what we got here. Maybe it's the same, hopefully. Um, sorry, there it is. Um, network session key, 2B and whatever. Maybe this is a different device or a different order. Yeah, obviously it's a different device. Maybe that one, two months ago, no. Uh, yeah, let's check. Oop. Yeah, so I, I've set up a couple of devices. Uh, this one is set up any other way. Anyway, um, so you, you get this key from, from a network service provider. In our case, uh, I get the session key from the Things Network. And this is the app key. <laughs> By the way, it looks the same um, in the sample code here. So there's a mistake in the sample code, but anyway. Um, the, the other key is the, the app key. And that's, that's this one. Actually, we also need not only the app key, we also need the application session key, which is down here. And uh, yeah, this, this goes into the source code then and make sure that you have the right byte order and bit order. 10 minutes ago, yeah, that's, that's the device. Um, yeah, you, you provided with the session keys here, um, the device address. This is what you have to change, those three addresses the, or those three uh, information, the, the, the keys here and the device address. Um, you could also um, change the code to, to distribute keys over the air. This is called over the air activation. Uh, then you don't have to provide the keys in the source code. Then you only have to provide the app key and the network key, not the network session key. Um, and then the, 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 the session keys will be derived in the joining process. Um, what else do we have? Some setup code. Yeah, for instance, this is the LED, uh, the built-in LED on the, on the, on the device. Um, we do some pin mapping. We say, okay, uh, this uh, device is connecting to LoRa via this and that um, pin. Um, yeah, then we handle the LoRa events, the LoRaWAN events. So it could be joining, joined, um, TX complete, transmission complete. Um, we can receive some data in the other direction, print it out. And uh, what else are we doing? We are sending something. Where's the send? Yeah, on send is here. Um, okay, now this is a timer. We, we perform a do send. And yeah, if, if the transmission is complete, this do send is being sent, or th this, this one sends the, the data, this function here. Uh, it's been, yeah, this sets up a callback and then uh, this, this method is being called back, um, this function. Yeah, here we, we put in the data. Um, this is for display, to set up the display with the right ports, with the right pins actually, with the right yeah, um, outputs of the ESP32. Um, this is an image. Um, just 
some fancy stuff. Um, let me show it to you, hopefully. Um, yeah, you have to store the image, not in a separate file, you, 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 you store the image as a byte array in, in the source code. Um, here, the logo is being printed and then yeah, the setup code uh, prints out the logo, sets up the, the all devices, uh, says program started. Um, we don't change this because we use the defaults. Um, for instance, here are the frequencies we can use. The things network defines actually um, eight channels plus um, an additional channel and a different band. Um, yeah, and in the loop, what what are we doing? We print out something on the on the screen. Um, we read data from our digital analog converter, analog digital converter, and then we we print it out on the screen and we put it in the buffer. Uh, actually, where is it? Buffered. Um, let me see the C here and uh, my data. Yeah, this is where we where we put the data. Um, let me see string counter my data. Where is it again? Um, Okay, yeah, yeah, this, this string is being sent. So everything that goes into this STR is uh, being put in, the, in this, this memory area. And uh, yeah, here we, we actually set uh, what we want to send. Um, let me check. Yeah, everything should work. We upload everything, yeah. So we have to save this first and um, yeah, I'm going to prepare the second camera. It shows like something has failed, the retrain failed though. What no, just it? doesn't and uh, the libraries are not very, very clean. So there's just some, some warnings coming out. Okay. Yeah, we can ignore that. It compiled. So now it's being sent to the device. And yeah, this is the output. So uh, this is the bitmap. And uh, yeah, it switches on the, it switches on the, the LED. This is the, the bright LED here. So it's a bit too bright actually. And then you can see the output. And yeah, the sensor readout is currently zero because we haven't connected anything. And this will be sent to, to our gateway. So what have we done? Um, again, the entire screen maybe, the entire desktop. Uh, what, we, what we have done is we have collected data and uh, we, we are sending it to the things network and then we receive it. Um, we, we put it in a database and from that database, um, from that looping database, we, we get the data to our own application and uh, use it to some data analyzers, such as uh, finding out whether the cleaning stuff is using a lot of cleaning agents, detergents, uh, everything that smells and, and uh, yeah, increases the ammonia concentration in the room. And uh, yeah, we, at the end we found out it's uh, a natural source for, for this ammonia peak in our measurements. Um, let, me, let me try to show you something. No, it, it won't work. Uh, can connect to the VPN. And then it might work. Uh, just in case I'm losing you, I will be back because uh, now I'm connecting to a VPN on my to my university, uh, site is not responding. 
Not even the VPN is working currently. No, it is. Okay. Fail to download topology. Again, whatever is going on. Nope. Um, let's see whether I do have an alternative VPN here. No, this is just the other way from outside to, to home. Um, yeah, so this means I can't show because the VPN isn't working. Again, find a try maybe. Fail to download topology, whatever this means. So the administrators have updated something. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to show you is um, a project called Grafana. And there you can you can show all your your um, IoT data or your your measurements in a graphical way. Um, yeah, it's an open source software. Then it looks like this. Yeah, you can you can show your sensor readouts. Uh, you have seen a screenshot uh, for the coffee machine and um, yeah, we did the same for the ammonia concentration we got from our office building. Um, by the way, the range of LoRa is up to 10 kilometers outside. So if the gateway is in the vicinity, let's say less than 10 kilometers away, you have a proper, uh, a, a fairly good chance if you, if you go outside your building, if you open the window and hold out the antenna, if the gateway is within, let's say five kilometers, you have a good chance that it is even working inside your building, inside your flat, depending on the gateway. Um, that's basically the, the idea. So we have distributed the, the key material. The key material is on the device. The key material, the keys itself can be read I can connect to that device and then I can steal it. Uh, in, in case of LoRa, it only affects one particular device. Um, yeah, but if I get hold on a device for let's say half a minute, if I extract a key, I can use that one and um, yeah, break, break into the system by, by reading out um, all the key material and um, by reading all messages. Hi, Christina, are you visiting? Hi, Thomas, I'm only yeah. visiting, I'm looking around. Yeah, we are, we are about to finish already. So uh, yeah. you, you, you arrived just in time. So uh, yeah, I think this was an overview about IoT infrastructure, IoT architectures. This was an overview about LoRa, LoRaWAN, um, the Things Network, community-driven network. Um, in some areas, there are commercial providers for LoRa service, LoRaWAN service. So you have everything like this in a, in a more commercial way. But this one is working quite, quite well. You can set up your own gateway if you want to. And um, yeah, basically, um, you, can, you can build your own IoT application within a couple of minutes. And it, even works outside your own building, outside your own flat, because you can use gateways provided by other enthusiasts in the vicinity. Um, any questions from your side? Can we create our account on, on this uh, console? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I'm, I'm using an, an account here. If, if you log out, you can create an account down here. So whatever you want to set it up within five minutes. Okay, thanks. And then you can, you can uh, place your own gateways, uh, install your own applications. So you will, you will be uh, all set in, in five minutes, I guess. Any further questions? Yeah. If, if you have any questions later on, don't hesitate to ask me on MetaMost or send me an email or um, try to use the chat in the, in the main hall. Bruno. Otherwise, yeah, Bruno has a question. Yeah, just to remind, uh, what, what was the example that you use in the Arduino IDE? The example? Um, yeah, yeah, about yeah, the Wi-Fi Yeah, the, the Wi-Fi scanning. Yeah. It was 
for this device. So I've set up this device, which is the one I, I have here, the, the white one. You yeah, might yeah. you might have a, a TT Go, which is the other one. In this case, you have to download a different device description. Yeah, yeah. actually, I think okay. the, uh, the one that I have is the, the white one too. Yeah, and then you, go, then you go here. Yeah. To examples, example for Wi-Fi LoRa 32. Oh, okay. You go to Wi-Fi, and there's a Wi-Fi scan, for instance. And then it sets up a Wi-Fi port, and then you can you can use that to scan. Okay, I'll try to. Yep. And to make sure you don't block the little antenna. It's up here. At the, I think it's a little, a yeah, little coil on that. Yeah, uh -huh. it's out of focus, so. Don't block that and you, you will be able to see your Wi-Fi network. Uh, you can also use this as a Wi-Fi access point. You can use that uh, yeah, as a client. Um, so mm -hmm. this is just sample code. If you don't want LoRa, if you want Wi-Fi, you can use that to deliver mm -hmm. your, your uh, sensor readings. Yes. Um, and there are a lot of other things to, to play around. Um, okay. yeah, this, for instance, is for the library. Um, this is um, showing you how to use um, over the air activation or activation by um, provisioning. So uh, everything is being, this is what we are doing. Um, yeah, if you want to use uh, TTN over the air activation, that's a simple code here. You will find, nice. you will find yeah. everything here. I try to play around. Yeah, I yep. configured my board, so now I can make some experiments here. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for being here. I'm available uh, in in the main hall. Um, enjoy your lunch. It's already yeah almost one o'clock in. Uh, Ukraine, I guess, you're one, one hour ahead. So um, enjoy your lunch and uh, yeah, have fun in the, the other uh, workshops. For me, it's a bit stressful because I have to repeat the same workshop again in the other, uh, in the other group. So um, let me check what your next workshop will be. You are group three, right? So group three will have workshop four, measuring on the physical layer. So Andreas will show you what to do. Uh, is this Andreas, I guess? Yes, Andreas will show you uh, yeah, how to play around with data, how to, to use um, the, the Raspberry Pi for data analysis. And um, you can even use, or he will even use the, 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 the little microcontroller you have. Thank you very much for being here. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>